okay, we are actually going to get into stock features a little bit, which is good. So let's talk about common stock features. And the first one we've already talked about a little bit are dividends. And you remember I said if a firm has been paying dividends forever and a day, they don't have to continue paying. There's no legal responsibility for them to do so. The dividends are not a liability of the firm unless they're declared by the board of directors. Once they're declared by the board of directors, they do become a liability. They do become a legal obligation to pay. But what board of directors would be stupid enough to declare a dividend they could not pay? I've not, I've yet to see one. So, and even if they did, let, let's give one example here. I believe this happened back in 2010. Uh, the Deepwater Horizon, a BP oil rig blows up in the Gulf of Mexico and BP declared a dividend, and then Obama <coughs> says, wait a minute, you guys don't need to pay any dividends until you get this mess cleaned up, because he was wanting to make sure they had enough cash to clean up the mess, and it all makes sense. Now, at that point, BP has already declared the dividend. It's a legal liability of the firm. The shareholders, in theory, could have pushed BP into bankruptcy, because it's a legal obligation to pay, and they didn't. But do you think the shareholders would have taken BP to court over that? It'd be kind of dumb because everyone else would get paid off before them, right? They'd be stuck at the end of the line and they know this is just a temporary thing. So even in the one case I can think of where this might have happened, uh, the, the shareholders don't say, hey, wait a minute, you got to go into bankruptcy. Okay, yes? Since BP was so big, if they would have done it, wouldn't the government have just helped them out of it? Oh, okay. So, um, but by the way, BP stands for British Petroleum. Okay. So if a government was going to reach in, it would have been the British government. Yeah. But here's the reason BP says no. By the way, does Barack Obama have, have did he have any direct authority over BP? No. What does he have authority over, though? BP wants to do some additional drilling out in Texas. Oh, well, hey, we're going to have to take a good close look at that, right? BP's bringing a tanker in from Oman into Shreveport, or not Shreveport, um, Port Charles, Louisiana. Oh, well, hey, there could be terrorists on board. We're going to have to quarantine that thing for a month and starve them out. I mean, there's all sorts of things governments can do to make your life very, very, very unpleasant. I mean, take a look at what's going on in Russia right now. Governments of the world are making life very, very unpleasant for some people, right? And so instead of telling Obama, <laughs> right, it's better to just say, my bad. <laughs> we'll, we'll take care of this. Don't worry. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Okay, payment of dividends is not considered a business expense. Remember, interest is considered a business expense, therefore it's tax deductible. But dividends are not. And so there's a tax advantage to debt that common equity doesn't have. And then finally, we need to talk about this whole double taxation thing. Dividends that you receive as an individual shareholder are taxable. I did my taxes on Sunday and I had some dividends and I had to pay taxes on them and that stunk because the corporation had already paid corporate taxes, right? And now I'm getting these dividends and I've got to pay taxes. Now, there is an exclusion for corporations. If a corporation owns the stock of another firm, then the corporation only has to pay taxes on 30% of the dividends it receives. And here's why. If a stock, let's say the company that the corporate owned stocks in uh, pays a dollar. That dollar in dividend goes into the big company, then they have to pay taxes on it, and then it goes, to, oh, so the first company pays corporate taxes, the second company pays dividend taxes, and then the, uh, the shareholder would also have to pay dividend taxes. That would be triple taxation. Apparently, double taxation is perfectly fine. <laughs> Triple taxation is beyond the pale. Apparently 2.3 taxation is okay too, because they pay 
but hey, what if I just buy 80% of the shares of this outstanding firm? Then I don't have to pay any taxes at all on the dividends I receive because it's considered to be an intra-divisional kind of, uh, it's, it's cash flows within the same company, and so the government doesn't tax you on that. So the lesson for you is, if you're gonna go out and buy another company, try to get at least 80% of the shares. It'll save you some money on your taxes. Any questions? So let's talk about shareholder rights. By the way, who are the owners of the company? The shareholders. So who gets to make decisions about what goes on at the firm? The shareholders. And so they have the right to vote on matters of great importance. Now let's talk about what kinds of things would not be voted on. How about day-to-day -day decisions at the firm? Things that immediately need to be done to keep things rolling. That's not going to be something that shareholders vote on. However, number one important thing that they're going to vote on is the board of directors. By the way, the board of directors are supposed to represent the shareholders and their interests. And as a result, the shareholders are the ones who elect them. And by the way, it's not, uh, so democracy is one person, one vote. Does that sound about right? But with uh, shareholding, it's not that way. It's one share, one vote. And it makes perfect sense because people who have more shares have more at risk at the firm and they should have more of a say about what goes on <coughs> at the firm. Now let's talk about proxy voting. Proxy voting is something that allows us to give the right to vote our shares to someone else. And so let's say I couldn't make it to the meeting, I'll ask Ms. Rafael to vote my shares, I'll give her my proxy. Typically the way proxies are done in the United States, it's via a mail-in ballot. And so that's how you would exercise your proxy voting. Now we are all so used to proxy voting in the United States, we assume it's that way everywhere, but it's not. And let's talk about what happens when it's not. I'll give you an example from France. In France, you actually have to show up at the meeting in order to be able to vote your share. So we're talking about the annual shareholders meeting. So let's consider a dairy farmer in the southern French town of Marseille. I think it's about three hours south of Paris, which is where the shareholder meeting would likely be. Now remember last time we talked about cows and how cows have to be milked in the morning and in the evening. You guys remember that? Okay, so think about this. You got this dairy farmer and what he'll have to do is get out, get up in the morning, milk the cows, jump in his Citroën, which is like a French car, drive like crazy to get to Paris, vote his shares, jump back in his Citroën, and drive all the way back down to Marseille in time for the evening milking. He owns 10 shares. Is it worth his time to do that? No. And so as a result, in countries without proxy voting, what we find is that minority shareholders, meaning those that own small amounts, they go unrepresented in decision making at the company. And so it's the big shareholders who have the reason to go to the annual meeting because they've got a lot at play here. They're the ones that are going to make the decisions for the company. Now I will tell you one other thing that I thought was interesting about proxy voting. In uh, Hong Kong, I believe they have proxy voting, but there are a lot of people who show up at the annual meetings because the annual meetings always have a buffet lunch. And so there are actually investment clubs of little old ladies that will buy one share in many different companies just so they have the right to attend the buffet lunch. And instead of trying to look at the annual report and figure out which investments they should make to profit more for the long term, what they look at is the typical date of the annual shareholder meeting because they don't want to overlap two lunches on the same day. Now, am I suggesting that as an investment technique for you? In the United States, it doesn't work as well because you can't just take a bus across town to get to all these different meetings, right? We're too spread out for that. Okay, now let's talk about the right to share proportionally 
get all dividends paid to common shares. We're going to see that some of these shares can't have differential voting rights, meaning different amounts, but they all have the same right to share proportionally in the cash flow to common shares. What does proportionally mean? If I own 10% of the shares, I'm going to get 10% of any dividends paid to common shares. If I own 50%, I will get 50% of that. And it makes sense that your return should be proportional to your investment you know, compared to the other shareholders as well. And then we also have the right to share proportionally in all assets remaining at liquidation after the liabilities have all been paid off. If you remember our former talks about bankruptcy, we say that the government's first in line there for your taxes, and then you've got all sorts of people you've got to pay off. You've got bondholders, you've got bankers, you've got the preferred shareholders, which we'll talk about today. And then all the way at the back of the line, you've got the common shareholders. So just imagine the remaining assets. By the way, remember, if it was a security for a bond, it's already gone, right? And so now we've got the remaining assets. We're going to basically liquidate them, put them in a big pot. And the judge, the bankruptcy judge, is then handing out the remainder of this cash to all these people. And if there's any money left by the time he gets to the back of the line, then that money is to be shared proportionally among the shareholders. So if I own 10% of the shares, I'm going to get 10% of what's left in the pot. Now, I have owned shares in two firms that went bankrupt. My father has owned shares in four firms that went bankrupt. Can you guess how much money we've received as a result of this residual claim at the end on assets? Just is it's a round number. Zero. 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 By the time everybody else gets paid off, and by the way, the lawyers get paid too, right? You can't do bankruptcy without a lawyer. The lawyer's going to get paid too. By the time they get to the shareholders, there's generally not enough to pay anybody anything. So I've never gotten a penny out of any of those bankruptcies. Questions? Now let's talk about cumulative voting versus straight voting. Let's start talking about straight voting. In straight voting, for every seat that is uh, available on the board of directors for this particular election, I get one vote. And so let's say that there are two seats available and uh, Ms. Rafael is, uh, is a candidate. I like Ms. Rafael, you guys don't. I own 50% plus one shares of the, of the firm. You guys own the remainder. Uh, I like Ms. Rafael, you don't, who wins? 50% plus one, who wins? Yeah. I do. I like Ms. Flowers. You do not. Who wins? Yeah. I do. Do you see that I'm going to get to uh, select every single board member simply just holding 50% plus one of the votes? Let's say there are 12 members on the board of directors. Uh, you know, logic and fairness tells us that I should be able to elect seven of them, right? Seven of the 12. Makes sense. I own more than half the firm. I should have more than half the directors, but I shouldn't be able to elect all of them. And so that's where cumulative voting comes into effect. And in cumulative voting, we've got two races going on here. So instead of getting one vote at a time, I go ahead and get my two votes per share up front, one for this race, one for that race. However, I can now put all of my votes on one race. And so now you guys, as minority shareholders, actually have a chance to win and get representation on the board of directors. Do you, as, as a minority shareholder, would you like to have representation? Yeah, and we're going to talk a little later about how, uh, how majority shareholders can rip you off. In fact, they don't even have to own the majority of the shares to be able to rip you off as a minority shareholder. Okay, now let's talk about uh, what kind of 
board member. If let's say we're a minority board member, let's say we're an activist investor. Are you guys familiar with activist investors? So what do activist investors do? They go out there and they buy up a small percentage of the firm. It's going to be a minority stake. But they buy up enough in order to be able to use this cumulative voting to get one member on the board. Now you're saying, wait a minute, one out of 12, that's probably not going to do you any good, right? Because it's, you're picturing a democracy in your head where they just vote and it's always going to be 11 to 1. But that's not necessarily the case. Let's talk about the kinds of people who show up on boards of directors. They're typically CEOs from other industries. They are heads, like the head of the American Red Cross, retired Army General, retired Navy Admiral, uh, politicians, and there's always one lawyer. This guess that could be you someday. Um, there's always one lawyer, uh, because of course they've got legal stuff they've got to do. Now, um, what do these people have in common? They're well-meaning and they want to do a good job, but they don't have expertise in the industry. So where do you think they're going to get their expertise in the industry? Who are they going to listen to? The CEO. And so the CEO can come in and can tell them all sorts of crap and they'll believe it because after all, uh, you know, Sarah's a nice girl, she does a great job, and uh, she, she's a scratch golfer. We can trust what Sarah tells us. And the board will tend to go along with that until someone manages to get an expert on the board who can tell them otherwise. So, for instance, uh, Alan Mulally used to be the CEO of Boeing. If I were trying to get someone on Airbus's board, by, by the way, Airbus is the other big airline manufacturer, if I were going to get someone on Airbus's board, I would want Alan Mulally because he can sit in the meetings and when the CEO comes in and says, oh, the whole industry is down, it's not my fault, it's because of the economy, Alan Mulally can say, bullshit, it's not. We, and we could look at Boeing's numbers and we could see that it's not. Now, do you think it's possible that having, and by the way, he wouldn't say that because people in boardrooms are just way too kind to say bullshit, but he would say, no, that's not quite right. Now, who, who are they going to listen to? The CEO? Or might they start to think a little bit more now that Alan Mulally, by the way, he was successful at Boeing, would they listen to what he had to say? Absolutely. And so they might stop believing everything the CEO told them and they might start making better decisions as a result. If you like eating at the Olive Garden, by the way, you guys aren't that old, are you? If you like eating at the Olive Garden, you like activist investors because that place was going to hell in a handbasket until Starboard Capital jumped in, got some people on the board, and straightened out the operation. So we see this all around us. It actually does work to have cumulative voting because you can get minority shareholder representation and you can make a real change. <coughs> Any questions? Okay, so how do you figure out how many shares you have to have in order to elect a, a board member? Well, it really depends on how many of these slots are open. So in our case, we had two slots open, and two would be in in this formula. So it would be one-third of the outstanding shares plus one. One-third of the outstanding. So if there were 300 shares outstanding, it would be 101 shares is what you would need. Now, keep in mind that is to be guaranteed to elect one director. If you can convince other people to vote along with you, which we'll talk about is a, called a proxy battle. We'll talk about that in chapter 21. But if you convince other people to vote along with you, you don't have to have even this many shares because you can still get that representation on the board. Any questions? Let's do an example here. Firm's got 10,000 shares outstanding. There are three directors standing for election. That means we're looking at 1 over 3 plus 1, which is 1 fourth, or 0.25. 
multiplied by 100,000 gives us 2,500, and we've always got to add 1, gives us 2,501. If I have 2,501 shares in this firm, I am guaranteed to be able to get a seat on the board. Questions? Okay. So let's talk about classes of stock. So you remember earlier we said that common shareholders have the right to share proportionally in the cash flows of the firm, but they don't always have the same control rights. So some firms have more than one class of share, and the big difference between those classes are the differential voting rights. So, for example, do you remember uh, Larry and Sergey from Google and their motto of don't be evil, which I think is kind of fun. By the way, they officially renounced their motto of don't be evil. So what does that mean? It's okay now, right? It's okay to be evil, apparently, at Google. Okay, so think about this, though. They're, you know, they're like the heroes of the people, don't be evil. By the way, when Sergey and Larry set up the shares, by the way, if you are the founder and you're the one that's bringing this firm public, you get to make this call. They said, well, let's have three votes for the Larry and Sergey shares and one vote for the rest of you schmucks. Now, what does that allow them to do? It allows them to maintain control of the firm even if they have less than the majority of the shares because they still have the majority of the votes, and that's what counts. So let's talk about Ford. Ford has two classes of shares, Ford Motor Company. By the way, the chairman of the board at Ford, his last name is Ford, and he's like the great-grandson or great-great-grandson of Henry Ford. Now, the Ford family has not had a majority of the shares in Ford for a really long time, yet there's still a Ford on top of the board. Okay, that even rhymes. So, the question is this, how do they manage to maintain control? It's because there's this magical uh, class of shares that can only be owned by descendants of Henry Ford and by charitable foundations endowed by descendants of Henry Ford and they all magically have like 10 votes apiece. And the votes that you could have, have just one vote apiece. By the way, are there any descendants of Henry Ford here in the room? I didn't think so. Okay, so uh, you guys, any shares that you guys could have would have ten, uh, one vote. Now, let's say that you happen to get into an elevator with a, memory, a member of the Ford family, and they say to you, would you like to buy some Ford shares? You say, yeah, because you know there are these special 10 voter share uh, votes, or 10 voter share shares. And so when they sell them to you, so something magical happens. Nine votes fall off of each share because they immediately transfer from being one class to another upon transfer outside of the Ford family or their charitable foundations. By the way, the charitable foundations, do you think they're going to vote in with the wishes of the Ford family? Absolutely they are. And so this is how you manage to keep uh, a Ford at the top of Ford over 100 years on. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, uh, some, and this is pretty mild stuff so far. Uh, do you think the Ford family is really out there ripping off minority shareholders? They're going to act in their own behalf, but they know they, they can't go too far because the United States has pretty good... Uh, institutions, meaning courts and laws, things like that, plus we've got a boatload of lawyers. And so you really can't stray too far without getting yourself into trouble with this multiple voting rights for share. However, if you are in some other countries, things can get pretty interesting. Let's say that you are a moderately wealthy businessman in Mexico. And uh, the time period is that of privatization, when the Mexican government is selling off the state-owned industries. And one of them happens to be the state-owned telephone company, Telefonos de Mexico. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Thank you. I have one Spanish speaker here. Okay. Telefonos de Mexico. And so the government with whom this person is friends, I'm not naming him because, you know, I'm going to put this online. I don't want to be 
accused of uh, slander. Anyway, so this guy is friends with people in power. And uh, they call him up and they say, hey, pal, would you like to buy Telefonos de Mexico? And he's like, well, of course I'd like to buy it, but I really don't have that kind of money. And they say, not to worry, we'll give you a great deal. And he says, yeah, it's still going to be too much money for me. And they say, not to worry, we'll get you a low, low interest loan from the state bank. In other words, it's the government loaning him the money to buy a government asset. Now, by the way, do you think his friends are doing this out of the kindness of their hearts? No, people are scumbags. And so they're expecting to be paid back somewhere in the future. Does that make sense? Okay, on with the story. And so this guy buys Telefonos de Mexico. And now he's trying to figure out how he can get even more rich as a result of his purchase. And he's like, you know what? I could sell shares in Telefonos de Mexico, and as long as I sell less than 50%, I can still keep control of the firm. And he tells his lawyer his idea, and his lawyer says, hey, let's go beyond that. Let's have these special shares just for you that have 10 votes per share, and these other votes can have just one vote per share, and you won't have to have more than 10% of the firm in order to maintain control of it. And the businessman says, Poof, that's a great idea. And so then he does that, sells 90% of the firm off, collects all that sweet, sweet cash. And by the way, you think he uh, <clears throat> helped some of his friends out at this point? <coughs> yeah, if you're, if you're the guy that made the call to him and offered to sell it at a discount, you're expecting a little payback at this point. Okay, on with the story. So then he's sitting on all that sweet, sweet cash, and he's like, you know what? I could be even richer, though. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up another firm over here that is 100% owned by me. And then I'm going to force Telefonos de Mexico to sell assets uh, worth $1 billion over here for $500 million. And then I will force, because I got these voting rights, right? I could force Telefonos de Mexico to buy back those assets at $1 billion. Now, what does that mean for Telefonos de Mexico? They basically lost $500 million because of this guy's superior voting rights. He owns 10% of the firm. He's just lost $50 million in Telefonos de Mexico. But he's laughing all the way to the bank. Why do you think he's laughing? Yeah, remember, he's over here. He just made, and by the way, this is 100% him. He gets to keep this 500 million over here. He's only lost 50 million over here. That means that there's really only been 450 million lost to other investors. By the way, who are the other investors? that 90% of shares that were sold to people that only have one vote, they're the ones that take it on the nose when this sort of stuff happens. So you gotta watch out for this sort of stuff and when you've got poor institutions and you've got the opportunity for corruption, which privatizations always do. And so you gotta keep an eye out for these things. Do you think that could happen in the US? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think someone would be called out for doing that. By the way, what's the, uh, what's the murder conviction rate in Mexico? Does anyone have an idea? Not very high. Not very high. It's about 2%. Why do you think that is? Do you think their, their police are just really that bad at gathering evidence? You can pay off the judge, right? The conviction rate in China is 98%. Do you think their cops are really that good? I'm just going to leave that one out there. You can think about it for yourself. Questions? So now let's talk about preferred stock. Do we call it preferred because we would rather have preferred stock than common stock? No. We call it preferred because this stock has preference over common stock when it comes to dividends and the residual assets at liquidation. 
And so you have to pay the dividends that you owe to the preferred shares before you can pay anything to the common shareholders. And the preferred shareholders also must be paid before the common shareholders at bankruptcy. Now we've got to know um, how much these dividends are and how much the liquidation value has to be in order to figure out what that uh, residual is for the common shareholders. And so the dividends for preferred are stated as a percentage of the liquidation value. In fact, what we'll do is we'll say, oh, this is 5% preferred. And so 0 0.05 times the stated liquidation value, which by the way, is 100 unless I tell you otherwise. The stated liquidation value is 100 unless I tell you otherwise. The stated liquidation value is 100 unless I tell you otherwise. Um, so 5% of 100 means this thing's paying $5 per year. And so we know we have to pay these preferred shareholders $5 a year before we can pay the common shareholders anything. We know we have to give them $100 at bankruptcy before we can give our common shareholders anything. And so it's, a, it's more of a fixed claim than common stock. Now, are dividends on preferred shares required no more than they are on common stock? But if you want to be able to pay uh, dividends to your common shareholders, you have to pay the preferred shareholders first. What kind of shares do you think executives get or are receiving from the board of directors as part of their compensation? Do you think they're getting preferred or common? <coughs> so they're getting common shares. And the reason is, remember, we only want the managers to get rich when the common shareholders get rich if we're going to make sure that uh, common shareholders get paid their dividends, including the managers, what are the managers going to make sure they do? They're going to make sure they take care of those preferred shareholders. Now, there are times, though, when firms get into trouble and they cannot make their payments to the, even the preferred shareholders. And what happens at that point is we end up with dividends in arrears. Dividends in arrears. So this would be called cumulative dividends. <laughs> and the way cumulative dividends work is if they don't pay the dividend on the preferred stock, then basically you get to write down, okay, they, they missed the payment of $1.25. And then they miss the next one and you get to write down, oh, it's another $1.25. And then finally they get around to paying the dividend. Well, before they can pay anything to the common shareholders, not only do they have to pay the current $1.25, they have to pay the $2.50 dividends in arrears before they can pay anything to the common shareholders. That's what we call cumulative dividends. However, the common shares, uh, and, and some preferred shares are non-cumulative, but most of them are cumulative. Common shares are always non-cumulative. Common shares are always non-cumulative when it comes to dividends because, hey, if they miss a, if they miss a dividend payment, poof, tough. It's not, not even required for them to pay it. Questions? Okay. So people might think that preferred stock looks a whole lot like debt. So first of all, that stated liquidation value, when I said it's 100 unless I tell you otherwise, it's 100 unless I tell you otherwise, did that sound a whole lot like my talk about the face value or par value of a bond? Yeah, it's 1,000 unless I tell you otherwise, it's 1,000 unless I tell you otherwise. Also, what about that dividend rate? Well, that looks a whole lot like the coupon rate that tells you the annual amount of coupon paid because we were taking that coupon rate times the face value. In this case, we're taking the dividend rate times the stated liquidating value. So that looks a whole lot like it. And then, uh, so we've also got uh, ratings. Some of these things have ratings just like bonds. We talked about bond ratings, you know, double A, BBB minus, and so forth. And you can see those same kinds of ratings on preferred stock. So this stuff is starting to look a lot like debt. And then finally, some preferred issues have 
obligatory sinking funds. What was the sinking fund for on bonds? Say again? Oh, okay, so it's to help reduce the chance of going bankrupt. Uh, the sinking fund, by the way, if you float a bond issue, it means you're borrowing money. So if you sink a bond issue, it means, yeah, you're paying off money, right? You're paying stuff off early. That's what the sinking fund is all about, is to pay stuff off early. Now with bonds, it's merely to pay stuff off early as opposed to waiting to the maturity date. But preferred stock has no maturity date. This stuff is going to stay out there forever unless we have some sort of mechanism for the company to buy it back. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to tell you a story here, and of course there's some artistic license with the story, but here's the story. The financial crisis. When you have uh, banks, and one of the banks starts to have trouble, do you think people think, oh, it's just that one bank? No, they're looking around at the other banks. And by the way, the assets of banks are loans. And we say that they're opaque because you can't just look at the financials of a bank and know the quality of its assets because you don't know whether they have lent money to mature adults or to spastic children, right? You just can't tell. You don't know if they've loaned money on speculative real estate deals. You just don't know where that money went. The reporting isn't that fine grain. And so when there's a problem at one bank, we have what's called a contagion in that people start to suspect the other banks. Now, typically what would happen here is that the bank CEO would go on CNBC or another business television channel and say, don't worry, everything's just fine. By the way, should you ever believe anything a CEO says on television? Absolutely not. Because anybody can do that. I have seen CEOs on CNBC after the close of trading for the day saying everything's cool, no problem, it's all going to be good. And then at 12.01 a.m. next day, they're submitting their bankruptcy papers. You can do it online, so that's easy to do at 12.01 a.m. Just whoop, right? Was the person lying through their teeth? Absolutely they were. So the only way you can signal that you are a healthy firm is to get someone else to, at a cost, signal that you are healthy. And so here's what happens. So it's called Goldman Sachs. Have you ever heard of Goldman Sachs? There's a guy in charge of Goldman Sachs at the time named Lloyd Blank Fine. And Lloyd Blank Fine is, says, you know, we know our company is healthy. We know we don't have a problem. But uh, it's getting really hard for people to believe that because everything else is falling around us. By the way, Lehman Brothers had just exploded. And so now everybody on all the big firms on Wall Street were in suspicion. And so Lloyd has a brainstorm. He says, what if I could get the best investor in the world to make an investment in our firm? Who do you think he called? If I say great American investor, who comes to mind? Yeah, Warren Buffett. And by the way, the guy that had the right answer is from Columbia. Americans, you're letting yourselves down here. Okay, so um, Warren Buffett. So Lloyd calls up Warren. And by the way, did I get to listen in on the conversation? No, so here's the artistic license. Uh, so Lloyd calls up Warren. He's like, oh, hey, Warren, how you doing? Warren says, Lloyd, cut the crap. What do you want? Lloyd says, well, everything here on Wall Street's a little crazy. No one can tell the, uh, the good stuff from the bad stuff. And, and Warren says, correct. He says, but uh, I was thinking that an investment from your Berkshire Hathaway would uh, signal to people that we were in good shape. Warren says, this is interesting. I'll tell you what, I'll send my guy tomorrow to go through your books. And so the next day, Warren's uh, accountant gets on a private jet, whoop, flies off to, to New York, goes to Goldman Sachs, and goes through all their stuff with a fine-tooth comb. And at the end of the day, calls Warren and says, Warren, these people are solid. Uh, this, you know, I, I'm not concerned about losing money on them. 
And Warren says, great, thanks for letting me know. And as soon as he gets off the phone with his person, Lloyd calls. Hey, Warren, your guy was here today. Have you heard from him? By the way, Lloyd knows, right? And Warren says, yeah. He says, it looks like we could do something. And Warren says, well, what kind of stock or what, what, were you in, what, were you, what were you wanting me to invest in? Lloyd says, common stock. Warren laughs. Why is Warren laughing? Warren doesn't want to be in the pool with a common stock just in case everything goes to heck. By the way, a, a, a bank can still go insolvent even if it's totally healthy if something called a bank run happens. And so Goldman Sachs could have gone insolvent just because uh, they were attacked by a crazy mob. And so uh, Warren's wanting to cover his, his assets. And so what does he do? He says, no, 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 I'll do preferred shares. Lloyd's not as happy as he was, but he says, okay, we can do that. And Warren says, and I don't remember the exact percentages, but Warren says, oh, what kind of percentages were you looking for on that, on that preferred? Because, of course, they've got to settle on the dividend percentage. And Lloyd says, mm, five. And Warren laughs. He says, no, let's do ten. 10% is expensive, expensive, expensive money for a bank, especially at that time. But is it really the money that Lloyd's getting out of this deal? No, it's that stamp of approval by Warren Buffett. Lloyd says, okay, we can do 10, but you've got to allow me to buy back these preferred shares over time because I can't afford 10% money forever. Warren says, okay, deal is done. So let's talk about what this means when you see a firm with preferred shares in their capital structure. By the way, are preferred shares required? Do firms have to have them? No, don't have to have them at all. So if you see preferred shares in the capital structure, to me, it's a pretty good sign that that firm has had difficulties at one time or another. And they've had to go outside for capital. And those outside capital providers uh, the company doesn't want to issue them debt because that would put the new capital provider in the position of forcing the company into bankruptcy, which they're already having enough trouble with, right? But the new provider of capital doesn't want to do common shares because there's a good chance they would lose everything. So the compromise is preferred shares. It's good for the company that's in trouble because the new investor can't force them into bankruptcy it's good for the new investor because they're going to get paid before all these common investors, common shareholders at the end of the line. Does that make sense? So, how do we know that this really isn't debt? Well, number one, preferred dividends are not tax deductible. Remember with debt, the periodic payments that are made are interest, and that can be subtracted before calculating your taxes. And so interest is tax deductible, preferred dividends are not. They're right down there with common dividends at the end. And preferred shareholders cannot force the issuer into bankruptcy. They can just keep track of their dividends in arrears and hope that eventually the company gets healthy enough to start paying those dividends. Questions? <clears throat> so let's talk about stock markets. And we can break this down in more than one way. And the first way we're going to market, break it down is between the primary and the secondary market. The primary market, let's just talk about some examples of primary market. If the firm does an IPO, that would be a primary market transaction. That's the first time those shares have ever been traded. You guys know what IPO stands for? Very good, initial public offering. And so that would very definitely be a primary market transaction. But then there are these things called SEOs. And depending on whether you're American or British, it can be seasoned equity offering. 
Or secondary equity offering. And what the firm is doing with either one of, well, it's actually the same thing. What the firm is doing here is selling additional shares beyond those that were sold at the IPO. Now, do you think the SEO is a primary or secondary market transaction? Yeah, we're all tempted to say secondary, but it's actually not. And here's why. Remember, we said that primary transactions are where the first time a security's been traded. And so it's the first time these particular shares had been out there for the public to trade. A secondary market transaction would merely be where one investor sells to another investor. So I've got 10 shares of GE, and I haven't been happy with them for years. And so I could actually go sell my shares to Mr. Zach, and that would be a secondary market transaction. How do I know the difference between primary and secondary? Well, the easy way is to follow the money. If the money eventually ends up in the hands of the issuing firm, then it's a primary market transaction. If the money hands up in the hand, ends up in the hands of another investor, then that is a secondary market transaction. Now you might say then, wait a minute, why would anyone care for their shares to be traded in the secondary market? And the answer is, the more liquid something is, the more valuable it is. If you remember back to the end of our discussion on bonds, there's that illiquidity premium. It's actually, uh, your stock will be more valuable if it's being traded out there on the secondary market. Also, if your stock is out there trading on the secondary market, you have a pretty good idea of what it's worth. And it's also a great indicator of whether or not managers are creating shareholder wealth or not, because you could just watch the stock price and know. Okay, that's the difference between primary and secondary. We can also break down our markets by whether we're dealing with dealers or brokers. A dealer is someone who holds an inventory and stands ready to buy or sell. Now, other than poker, can you give me an example of a dealer? Yeah, a car dealer. A car dealer holds an inventory, obviously stands ready to sell, will also buy your used car, and they don't even, you don't even have to have a trade-in. The last car that I sold uh, to Youngblood Nissan, I just sold it to them and they wrote me a check. I didn't buy a new car from them at all. Okay, so that's a dealer. Any other example of dealers other than poker? Someone usually says drug dealer, right? And so we could ask this. Uh, do they hold an inventory? Do they stand ready to sell? Yes. Do they stand ready to buy? I would imagine, right? If you had the good stuff and the right offer, hey, sure. Okay, now let's discuss that versus a broker. Does the broker ever actually take possession of the item for sale? No, let's think about, by the way, real estate broker is the one that usually pops to mind. And uh, real estate broker, I would have loved it when I was in Mississippi for my real estate broker to have bought my house. And there are people that will do that, but that's not what a broker does. The broker puts buyers and sellers together in exchange for what? The commission. By the way, how does the dealer get paid? They pay less for something and sell it for more, right? And it's that difference is how they get paid. When a broker sells something, and it's, it's in exchange for a, com uh, yeah, a commission. Okay, so let's talk about dealer markets versus auction markets. A dealer market would simply be a network of dealers that are put together, and they are basically creating this, this uh, pretty liquid market to where you could go out and buy different securities. And in fact, we say that a dealer is making a market in a security if they are holding the uh, asset and stand ready to buy or sell. And we talked about that with bonds. 
Now, compare that to the auction market. If you picture a stock exchange in your head, you probably are picturing the New York Stock Exchange. You're picturing all the people on the trading floor, the bell ringing, the papers flying up in the air, that sort of stuff. That's an auction market. So what are our examples of dealer markets? Well, there's the NASDAQ, which is where it used to stand for the National Association of Security Dealers Automated Quotation System. That's what NASDAQ stood for. But just like KSC, they said they don't want it to stand for that anymore. It's just NASDAQ. By the way, what does KFC stand for? Kentucky Fried Chicken. We will never forget, right? <laughs> Okay, so uh, NASDAQ is a dealer network. In fact, NASDAQ is a computer network because all of these different dealers have their computer terminals where they can enter both bid and ask. By the way, bid is what they're willing to pay you for your shares. Ask is what they would sell to you for. And the ask always has to be bigger than the bid or the dealers don't make money. And so on NASDAQ, what they're doing is they're putting in their quotes. And by the way, lots of different dealers might have inventories of these shares. Lots of different dealers might have posted a bid in the ask. The ones that you see when you go out to look up a quote are called the inside quotes. It's going to be the very highest bid and the very lowest ask. And so those are, and by the way, they don't have to be from the same dealer, right? And so those are the ones that you're going to see, but in truth, there's a lot, there are a lot of quotes on either side of those. Okay, now let's talk about pink sheets. By the way, what does OTC stand for? Over the, uh, Ozark Technical, no, it's, uh, it's uh, over the counter. And uh, so let's talk about pink sheets. Have you seen the movie Wolf of Wall Street? Yeah, that's what this guy's doing. By the way, classic scheme. Um, I go out and I buy up, these, call, these are called penny stocks, right? But you can hardly buy anything for a penny anymore, so let's call them dollar stocks. You go out there and you buy up this, the shares in those little crappy companies that no one cares about. And then what do you do? You start to put out the word about how great this investment opportunity is. This is called a pump and dump scheme. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go out there and we're actually going to talk up the value of this stock. We're going to do it on internet chat boards. We're going to do it by this boiler room tactic that the Wolf of Wall Street used where you call these poor unsuspecting schmucks and you get them to buy these shares. And all that buying that you're now inducing, what does it do to the share price? Yeah, it pumps it up, right? So what do I do? How, do? how do I make money off this scheme? Well, you remember I bought those shares in the beginning and I'm sitting on them? Well, I wait till the moment's right, until the fever's just about to break, and I sell all my shares. What happens to the share price then? What happens to all the schmucks that I called on the phone and told them to buy this stock? Yeah, they're out. So now, if you're going to do pump and dump right, that means you have to continually find new victims. Because when you call the guy back for the next one, you're like, I got a deal this time. He's like, nope, right, if he's smart. You either got to have new victims or dumb victims. Right? And by the way, do dumb victims keep their money very long? No. Okay. So, long story short, I'm very hard pressed to understand why anyone would play in the pink sheets. Because it's basically, it's kind of like taking a, a walk down a dark alley at 2 a.m. in the worst possible part of town. I'm pretty sure something bad's going to happen, right? You might get through there without getting stabbed, but it's unlikely. You might be able to play in the pink sheets without getting ripped off, but it's unlikely. Okay. Now, we mentioned New York Stock Exchange being an auction market. Um, American Stock Exchange is also an auction market. But both of those are actually, or at least I know for sure, the New York Stock Exchange is partially going over to electronic trading as well. And so when the action starts on the New York Stock Exchange, you really only see those people out there doing the hand signs and stuff for about an hour, and then things settle down. It basically just goes to a very quiet, quiet place. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal a while ago about people sitting on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange watching DVDs and eating pizza because there just wasn't enough action to keep them busy. Questions?
We'll talk a little bit more how auction markets work here in a second. So, New York Stock Exchange used to have what were called seats. And if you had a seat on the exchange, that allowed you to trade uh, commission-free on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Now, are they going to let you do that for free? No. Seats had value. I think the last seat that sold went for something like $2 million. And so that's, well, that was the ownership structure of the New York Stock Exchange. It was owned by these holders of the seats. However, the New York Stock Exchange then went through a change where they became a, an investor-owned company. And so instead of having a seat now, let's say that there were 100 seats outstanding. Now, instead of having a seat, I had 1% of the shares of the new firm. And so then I could do whatever I wanted with those shares. But now we have to have a way to figure out who is allowed to buy and sell um, transaction or commission-free on the New York Stock Exchange. And the answer is now the license holder. So you can go out and buy a license. The last I checked, it was about $50,000 that got you the ability to stand on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and buy and sell stocks commission free. And there is more than one kind of license holder. There's the most important one. They're called designated market makers or DMMs. Back in the old days, they were called specialists. And the specialist is basically a, a, a very tiny dealer and they hold a small inventory of the stock that they're specialist for, and they have a bid and an ask price posted for those shares. Now, the specialist is always going to have uh, the widest bid ask spread. If you if you could trade with anybody else, you probably don't want to deal with the uh, designated market maker, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a little bit. And then you have the floor brokers. Oh, by the way, these specialists, uh, let's talk about the specialists for Walmart. There is one and only one place on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange where you can buy or sell Walmart stock. And that is from the specialist who handles Walmart stock. And the same is true of every single stock on the exchange. Now, if you're a big stock, the chances are that the specialist only handles one stock, like Google, Walmart, stuff like that. But uh, when you get into smaller stuff, maybe a specialist is handling more than one stock. But if you want to trade a particular stock, there's always a specific spot on that floor where you need to be. Floor brokers are people who are trading on their client's behalf. And so these will be people like from TD Ameritrade, um, Charles Schwab, Morgan Stanley, people like that. They are there trading on behalf of their clients. The requirements are that they get best execution for their clients. What does that mean? The highest possible bid price, the lowest possible ask, that's what they're going after. And if they can make an improvement over that, then they have done their clients a favor. And then finally, we have these people who used to be called floor traders. And these people are actually investing their own money. Now, if you're not any good at this game, you don't stay at it for very long because once the money's gone, you're out of there, right? So these people, now they have a new name, Supplemental Liquidity Providers, Supplement or SLPs. Supplemental Liquidity Providers are basically there buying and selling, but they're not doing it on <laughs> fundamentals. They're not even doing it on news. They're probably doing it based on reading the room. By the way, on the floor of an exchange, do you think you can feel when the emotions change? Yeah. So I'll give you an example. Um, I was waiting for an airplane. I, we were out in San Francisco trying to fly to Hong Kong. And they said, everybody off the plane, there's a fuel leak. And they got us all off the plane, and they kept giving us that 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. You guys had that at the airport, the 20-minute thing? Anytime they say 20 minutes, just rest assured they're lying. Okay, so we finally get to the point where the crew times out, and they're going to send us to some flea bag motel for the night. And do you think that the mood changed? Absolutely. I was at an at a, uh, airline desk in Houston, Texas one time where they actually had to call the cops 
you could feel the mood change and the people behind the desk saw it and they had to call the police and keep it. It was a flight from New Jersey. <laughs> okay, back to the story. If you're on the floor of the exchange, do you think you can tell when people are being greedy? Yeah, do you think you can tell when people are being um, fearful? And more importantly, do you think you can tell when it changes from one to the other? Oh yeah, and when you see him cresting from greedy to fearful, what do you do? Get out, right? And when you see him crisp turning from being fearful to being greedy, you jump in. And so that's what these people are really doing, is reading the room and trading on that. Can you have that same sort of uh, information sitting at your computer? No. These people are not day traders in the sense that you guys think of day traders. These people are there on the floor and they're reading the room. Questions? So let's talk about what goes on at the New York Stock Exchange. First of all, the orders come in. Back in the old days, the way this worked is it come in by telephone. A runner would write it down and then run the order out to the floor broker. The floor broker would go to the specialist post to do the transaction. Now we've got, of course, electronic, where it can, uh, it, you don't have to have necessarily the phone and the runner. All of this stuff takes place at the designated market maker's post. Let's assume Ms. Rafael is the uh, Walmart DMM. I'm wanting to sell 100 shares of Walmart. Ms. Flowers is wanting to buy 100 shares of Walmart. And I'm heading up to the Walmart specialist spot, and so is Ms. Flowers. Our eyes meet across the room. I say, I'm buying. Are you selling? And she says, yes. And I say, 100 shares? And she says, yes. Now, of course, it's not really this easy, is it? Right. Okay. So, uh, now we figured out that we have the same thing in common. We, what we need to figure out is a price at which we're going to trade. We look over and Ms. Rafael has a bid price of 100 and an ask of 101 posted. What do you think we settle at? So we know we're not going to go lower than 100 or higher than 101, right? Otherwise, we just trade with Ms. Rafael, who, by the way, is hoping that we don't get along so she can get this big, fat, bid-ass spread out of us. What are we, oh, come on, folks. What are, what are, just throw out a number between 100 and 101. Yeah, $100.50. Now, it's good because I've, let's see, I can't even remember what I'm doing. Oh, I'm buying. I'm saving my clients 50 cents a share. She's making an additional 50 cents a share for her clients. We're very happy. Ms. Rafael is a little bit put off, but Ms. Rafael is still responsible for, uh, for recording this transaction. And so you write down what you think we've agreed to, I write down what I think we've agreed to, and together we hand that to Ms. Rafael, and she staples those together, and then at night they go through and make sure that all those things match up. If they don't, then we're going to be having lunch tomorrow to try to figure out who's, who's messed up here, right? That's why when you put a trade in on the stock exchange, you won't get a confirmation, a true confirmation, until the next day because it has to go through this overnight matching process. And what I was just talking about there was working the order in the crowd. By the way, if, uh, if she had wanted to sell 200 shares, she might have, there might have been a deal where she sells 100 to me and she sells 100 to someone else. And she might end up with getting different prices on those other shares. Now, if all else fails, we trade with the designated market maker, which we said was like a mini dealer. And because Ms. Rafael is sitting here on an inventory of Walmart stock and always standing ready to buy or sell, then we say that there is always a continuous <coughs> market in that stock as long as the stock market's open. You can always sell Walmart. You can always buy Walmart because there is always a specialist at the New York Stock Exchange standing there with an inventory standing ready to buy or sell. Is it going to be your best option? Probably not. But hey, if you're the only game in town, 
then uh, you can get paid better, which is what Ms. Raphael is doing. Now let's say Ms. Raphael is not quite an ethical person. What could she do? Well, she could see me coming up with a bunch of shares that I wanted to sell. When I sell those shares, what's going to happen to the price of the stock? It's going to go down. And so Ms. Raphael is sitting here on an inventory of the stock. She sees me coming up, carrying this big load of stock, wanting to sell it. So what's she going to do? She says, aha! She sells all the stock from her inventory, which before she buys the stock from me. This is called front running. Front running. She could also do it the other way. What if I wanted to go out and buy a bunch of stock? Well, she could buy a bunch for her position, drive up the price, and then when I buy this, the price is going to go up even more, and then she can get herself back to a regular inventory <coughs> by selling this inflated stock. Here's what you need to know. This is entirely illegal. Front running is entirely illegal. And it's so funny because every five years or so, you'll see where someone goes to federal prison for doing this. And my guess is that the people who go to federal prison for doing this have been there slightly less than five years. Because otherwise, they would remember seeing Ms. Raphael being walked off the exchange floor in handcuffs doing the perp walk. Does that make sense? Okay, question. <laughs> So we've already talked about the NASDAQ. It's this computer network that connects these dealers. Um, and it's a multiple market maker system. So when we have the DMM, that's a single market maker system. And Ms. Rafael was the only game in town as far as market makers go. But with NASDAQ, anyone who's holding an inventory standing ready to buy or sell, they are said to be making a market. And so we've got a bunch of those people connected. The thing I want you to really get from this slide is about the electronic Communication networks, or ECNs. <clears throat> Electronic communication networks allow a couple of things that would have blown our minds, say, 20 plus years ago. The number one thing they allow you to do is to trade outside of hours. So you can trade in the after hours. You don't have to wait for the market to be open in order to trade. And so if you decide at 3 o'clock in the morning that you just have to have five shares of Amazon, there's a good chance that you can find someone out there who's willing to sell to you. And in fact, that uh, person that's willing to sell on the, on the ECN, uh, they are actually acting as a dealer at that point, or at least a, a seller, but they have set up their own, perhaps, a bid and ask out there. And so that's the second thing ECNs allow you to do, is to set yourself up like a dealer. Now, would I suggest that you do that? Absolutely not. It would be so easy to type in the number wrong and find yourself wake up poor, right? Bad, bad idea. I wouldn't do that if I were you. But this does mean something for the people in New York. It used to be that they would go in in the morning and then they would play rough all day and then when the bell would ring, they could go to the bar and relax, have a beer with their friends and go home and go to sleep because nothing major was going to happen until the exchange opened again on the next day. Is that true anymore? Nope. And what happens is these people uh, who trade, they have to basically watch stock prices around the clock anymore. And so these people write about, or they talk about, it, it's been reported in the Wall Street Journal, every time they get up in the night to go to the bathroom, what do you think they do? Yeah! Isn't that a terrible life? Oh my goodness, talk about a way to uh, get yourself into smoking, drinking, and overeating. This is really uh, the excellent prescription for that. Questions? Okay, so let's take a look at some stock market reporting here. Okay, here we go. So, you can see that the current price of Apple is $171.90. It is up $1.69 since the stock opened today. That's about 1%. By the way, in the US, green means up. In China, green means down. 
In the U.S., red means down. In China, red means up. It's just a cultural thing. Red's a lucky color in China, so that's it's good stuff, right? Okay. Now, let me make this a little bigger, make it easy to see. Okay. The previous close, that was at the end of the market day yesterday, was $170.21. Notice that the stock doesn't have to open at the same price. It opened at $171.06. Why? Because there was news in the night. Remember we talked about the unexpected portion of news is what drives stock prices? Do you think news stops when the market's not running? No, still stuff goes on. And so we see prices went up uh, overnight. Um, the bid and the ask. Oh my goodness. This, see, this is why I don't go with Yahoo anymore. Would, it, would we have such a thing? Probably not. And it's, they're saying that the bid and the ask are both $117.32. If that were true, would the dealer be making any money? No. Do you think dealers are in the charity business? No. What we're probably looking at here are quotes from two different dealers. Uh, and you'll notice it's got the buy 800 and buy 900. Right now, you could go out there and you could uh, buy 900 shares for 171.32, and you could sell 800 shares for 171.32. So, if you wanted to sell more than that, then you would be paying. You would get less than 171.32. So, you might be able to sell another 800 shares at 171.31, or 1,000, or 1,500 shares. If you want to buy them, it's 171.32, and if you want more than 800, then what you would have to do is go out there and pay more than in order to get those extra shares. If you're wanting to buy stuff, you want the lowest price, right? But if you want more shares than are on offer, you're going to have to raise your price of what you're willing to pay. If you want to buy shares, and or if you want to sell shares, then and you want to sell more than 900, you'll have to accept less. Now, what else we got going on here? We got the day range. It's ranged from 170.21 uh, up to 172.87. And right now, let's see where it's at. It's closer to the bottom end of that. Does that give us any information? No. Uh, the the 52 week range, oh, it's from 118.86 up to 182.94. Uh, does that mean because this is pretty much closer to the top than the bottom that the stock is overpriced? No. What if it was on the bottom end of this? We would say, woo, the stock's on sale. No. It could just keep going down, right? Because that's entirely possible. And I can tell you from personal experience, having bought stock in a company named Lucent during the dot-com bust, you can ride it all the way down to zero. Okay. That's one of my two bankruptcies. Now the volume, uh, by the way, keep in mind we're not all the way through the trading day here, but so far about 46 million shares have traded. That's about half the average volume. We're a little more than half the way through the trading day, so today is on the relatively lighter side of trading. Now let's talk about market cap. If you remember back to chapter three, market capitalization is the number of shares outstanding multiplied by the share price. And so if you took 2.806 trillion and divided by 170.21, you could tell how many shares of Apple are outstanding. You could tell how many shares are outstanding just by doing that little math there. Next they tell us the beta, 1.19. By the way, 5Y monthly. They're figuring beta based on five years worth of data, five years worth of monthly data. That's what that means. Now remember we said that beta changes over time, right? And I think five years is probably an appropriate amount of time. Would you want to do it just over the last year? No. Would you want to do it over the last 25 years? Absolutely not. Um, by the way, is that safer or riskier than the market overall? Yeah, it's riskier, but not much, about 20%. The P.E. ratio, 28.59, 28.59. Um, if they were, so EPS is uh, $6 per share. If we multiply that by 28.59, we should be getting the, the share price that we've got up there. Now, something I want to point out, TTM, what do you think that stands for? 
Trailing 12 months. Trailing 12 months. So there's two ways you can do PE ratios. One is with the trailing 12 months, which is known with certainty, or with the forecast for the next 12 months. And so if you're looking at this trailing 12 months for anything, basically it's like driving your car looking in the rear view mirror. And you're like, whew, I don't want to do that. What will I do instead? I'll use those forward looking estimates. But here's what we need to know about those. They're estimates. They're swags, right? You guys remember what swag stands for? Scientific wild ass guess. Very good. Okay, so it's just a swag. So your choice is either driving your car, looking through a totally fogged up windshield, looking forward, or looking in the rear view mirror and seeing where you've been perfectly. Are either one of those ideal? No, that's called risk, and that's why we get paid to invest in stocks, because of that risk. Forward dividend, what does that mean? It means we expect over the next year they're going to pay 88 cents. If I take 88 cents and divide it by the current share price, I get around half percent. Are people buying Apple stock for the dividends? No. They're buying it for capital appreciation. X dividend date, what does that mean? If you bought the stock on February 3rd, you would receive the next dividend. If you bought it February 4th or later, you will not be receiving the next dividend. And then the one-year target estimate, $193.53. That's higher than the stock price is now, but is that a guarantee? No, nobody knows for sure. By the way, who comes up with that? Equity analysts put their estimated stock price out there, what, their one-year target, and then they just take the average of it. And by the way, I know some of these people. Do I trust this number? No. No. By the way, should you trust buy, hold, and sell ratings from equity analysts? No. Should you be buying individual stocks? No. You should be buying, remember, diversified portfolio, right? Take a look at this chart. There are people who will look at that chart and say, I can tell you where the stock price is going to go next. Let me tell you with certainty, those people are absolutely full of shit. Nobody knows.